Welcome to the Wheeler Opera House and to the first of the um, public, Wheeler Public Lectures for this year. Uh, my name is Stephen Block. I'm at the Stanford University and I'm a biophysicist. I hold positions in the Departments of Applied Physics and the Department of Biology at Stanford. Um, biophysicists, for those of you who haven't heard about this, are people who use mostly physical techniques to study biological problems. And some of those techniques are really quite powerful. Um, this week, assembled at the Aspen Center for Physics, right out near the Meadows, um, we're holding something called Single Molecule Biophysics 2015. This is, in fact, our eighth biennial meeting. So this has been going on for 16 years. Uh, the Aspen Winter Physics Conferences themselves have been, are now in their 30th year. Uh, that series was actually founded by my father, in 1980, uh, Martin Block, back in 1985. And um, it's my pleasure with Tom Perkins, who's seated, seated here in the front row, uh, to run uh, the Single Molecule Biophysics co Conference for this week. And so assembled from all over the globe are about 100 biophysicists here for this very exciting conference. It's absolutely my favorite meeting of all. That's because I get to help design it and it, make it the way we like. And the way we like is to have lots of hours in the middle of the day to go off and ski Highlands and Ajax. So if you're out there today, it was epic, you know. All right, uh, but we get, we, we're up late at night discussing science, and we, we talk about it on the lift on the way up, and we talk about it over lunch and on the way down. Um, and we talk about what's called single molecule biophysics. You can ask, well, what the heck is that? It's, it's actually an exciting and relatively new field of, of biology um, in which advanced optical methods uh, are used to study individual biological molecules literally one at a time. In the past, if you were a biochemist, you did something, a test tube, and you had, you know, gazillions of molecules there, way in excess of a trillion, and you measured their average properties. But average properties can be very misleading. You know, imagine some alien race came down to the planet uh, to observe humans, and they wanted to know what the humanoid form is like, so they sucked up into their device several humans, absconded with them. Uh, and measured average properties, and they went back to their planet and said, what are humans like? Well, humans basically, they, you know, they've got one head, they've got two arms and two legs, and they have one ovary and one testicle. <laughs> Which is true on average. Um, so this is why it's very important to be able to look at things individually, and you can learn a lot more. Uh, one of the things that we study a lot in biology are enzymes. Most of you know what enzymes are. These are proteins. And they're very specific proteins. They're proteins that can carry out chemical reactions. They carry out the reactions of life, uh, including, you know, for example, making DNA and making more of us and, and uh, making us move and making us ski and everything else. And uh, so now comes the biology quiz for all of you. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of ATP. Wow, good, that's great. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. It's a little fuel molecule, and it's used in biology for just about everything. It's the thing that powers a lot of enzymes. It's the thing that powers the synthesis of DNA. It's the thing that powers your muscles when they contract. It powers or, or fuels the synapses in your brain as you think and as you're hearing to me. And, and, and there is a very special enzyme in your body that makes most of your ATP. Some of it comes from just burning sugar, but most of it comes from this particular enzyme. It's the most remarkable enzyme, in my opinion, in all of biology. And today's speaker, is one of the world's experts on this. He's gonna tell you about this amazing enzyme. Um, but a, just a bit of history before we get him up because he's too modest to tell you all this story, but I'm not. Um, he's so modest, in fact, that if you've read the little blurb here, um, um, it, it, it's, it's written in a very Japanese way, but you can, you can detect his modesty, but also his trenchant sense of humor. So I encourage this as obligatory reading to every one of you. Um, uh, the, um, the story I wanted to tell you was a little bit about this enzyme. The enzyme's been known for a very long time. Um, and back in the 1970s, uh, a biochemist named Paul Boyer, working at UCLA, was studying the chemical cycle of this. And, and just like the aliens from outer space, he was measuring average properties but, uh, in, in bulk measurements. But it looked very much like, um, it looked very much to him that, that uh, this enzyme for all the world uh, was handing off uh, from one part to the next, like the firing of pistons in a motor. And, you know, they say chance favors the prepared mind. Back in the 70s, another biologist named Howard Berg had worked out that the, the flagella on bacteria, which caused them to swim, actually spin. They're actually rotary motors. But they're big things. They're about the size of a virus. Paul Boyer had the chutzpah to suggest that maybe this enzyme that makes ATP, which is very much smaller than the size of a virus, it's the size of a single protein, maybe this enzyme actually rotated. 
and it was a tantalizing idea, and it sort of fit the data, but you know, no one could tell for sure. And then later, at, in Cambridge in England, John Walker solved the structure of this enzyme, solved the crystal structure of this enzyme, and it sure looked like it might be a rotary motor, but the proof was lacking. And then came Kazuhiko Kinoshita Jr., our speaker tonight. He did a truly remarkable experiment in, on, back in around 1996 and 7, in, in which he's going to tell you about tonight. Uh, and they say seeing is believing. And he created an experiment in which you, you could actually watch this tiny, tiny little enzyme at the single molecule level turn and spin round and round. Um, he presented that to a packed room at the Biophysical Society meeting that year. I was there, I was fortunate enough to be in the audience. They were streaming out the door, the lights were down, the stage went up, and Kazo showed us all these remarkable films. Uh, it was a thing of beauty. And um, in fact, later that same year, uh, Paul Boyer and John Walker were co-awarded the Nobel Prize uh, for discovering this enzyme. But the real proof of how it works is actually due to our speaker tonight. And so I'm gonna turn the floor over to him. His name is Kazuhiko Kinoshita Jr. He's at the University of Waseda, Waseda University in Japan. Uh, and um, he's been a little bit reluctant to come up and speak to us tonight because of his modesty, but he has done some fabulous experiments. Not only did he prove that this rotated, he's gone on to show the rotary steps that it takes as it goes chickety chickety all around. He's run the motor forwards, he's run the motor backwards. He's he used torque to make ATP, he used ATP to make torque. And we're gonna hear all about that now, so. Hold on to your seats for an exciting lecture. Kazuhiko Jukunoshita. Thank you very much, Steve. You have done most of my talk, so I'm, I'm already done. <laughs> but listening to the same thing twice may help you understand better, so I will speak a little bit. But the first thing I want to say is that the, I apologize that I'm not wearing a tie. I'm not a formal authoritative person, so I invite you to listen to my talk with doubts. So doubting is the basis of science. So never believe, never trust, particularly never trust upon me. That's <laughs> how you understand things. And the, I know that Steve eats. <laughs> I, I presume he also breathes. This, I, I'm not very sure, because we've never been in the kissing distance. <laughs> so I, I simply assume that he breathed. I breathed, and I ate lunch several hours ago. So why do we eat, and why do we breathe? And that's the topic of tonight. And before I start, I, I want to summarize what I'm going to show, uh, tell. To, but, Steve has already done this, so it may not be necessary. We eat and breathe to rotate tiny engines in our body to let them make ATP. ATP is a fuel for molecular machines in our body that sustain all activities like skiing, running, thinking. And this is the first part of my talk. And in the second part, I will talk about the performance, beautiful, marvelous performance of the rotary engine with the name F1. So this is the second part. And so once you understand this summary, you can ignore what I'm going to tell you in the next 10 slides or so. And probably you know, you may know, you are a heater of 100 watt. And that's why if you pack five people in a small tent, you do not need a stove. In Aspen in winter, you may need 20 people, but then that's sufficient to, to be uh, happy warm. And I was told that I should never present an equation like this in my presentation, <laughs> but I will show you, well, several equations, uh, just because th there are, I hope, some of you who want to confirm my calculations to convince yourself. And those few, or possibly those many, are invited to become a scientist. And others just ignore such equations that are in shape. But the, if you do this, these calculations, 100 watt 
is equivalent to 2,000 kilocalories per day. And this number, 2,000 kilocalories, is the average food, no, no, is the amount of food an average Japanese eats a day. American people may eat slightly more, <laughs> but <laughs> probably not 3,000. And so with kilocalories kilo is a unit to measure the amount of food. And the, but actually it's the unit of energy. And this, you may know that how this number comes. You, you have a food for, for one day and you bring it to a laboratory and you literally burn it. Then you get this much heat. That's how you get this number. And the, the fact that this number equals this number means that you burn the food you eat uh, with oxygen you inhale. You know that to burn something, you need oxygen. And that's why you inhale, inhale oxygen to burn the food you ingest. And I, I say almost here, because some of you may wish to keep aside some food for your belly, and those people eat more than this limit. <laughs> so it seems that we eat and breathe just to warm the globe. Is it true? Probably it is. But I, I'm going to say that heat is an end, end result. And although I said that we burn the food in our body, we do so very slowly so as not to produce heat immediately. Instead of producing heat, uh, we produce ATP, which is a chemical, uh, which is the fuel molecule for most biological activities. And this is the ATP, a small molecule is made of tens of atoms. And you don't remember the, its full name, just ATP. And this ATP supplies energy for all of your activities, like running and thinking and digesting. You may think, why do you consume energy for thinking? When you think, electrical currents run in your flow in your brain. And so after you think, you have to recharge small batteries in, in your brain. So your brain consumes a lot of energy when you think. So don't think too much. <laughs> but the, so the summary of this slide is that food and oxygen makes ATP. And that fills your activities. Why do I say your activities? Uh, well, this is a summary, and the, I'm, I, I'm going to make a supplementary comment. All these activities eventually end up in heat, because after you run for a long distance, you do not change the globe in any way. You just enjoy jogging or running. So you consume the energy from ATP just to enjoy your life through these activities. From the point of view of the globe, you are nothing but a heater. The globe doesn't mind whether you think or run or digest, unless you, you think in, you are too clever to invent an atomic bomb to break the globe. So the life is something before you do these activities. You dissipate the energy into heat. You can enjoy it. So, so life is basically a uh, waste of energy. And <laughs> that's why I say your activities. I have lived long enough, so I no longer need to eat and breathe. I can die any, any time. So let, let's think that. How, how come ATP supplies energy for molecular machines? ATP, when it is split into two entities called ADP and phosphate, it liberates energy. If you're a physicist, these two quantities have lower energy than this one, and that's why energy is liberated. And this uh, energy is obtained by splitting ATP uh, drives many tiny molecular machines in your body 
I just show you one example. Here you see a molecular motor with two foot or, and two, two legs. And it seems this is a more or less real movie, not a fake. Uh, the, this motor uh, apparently walks like a human carrying a nutrition to a target place in your brain. And the, this motor works using the energy of ATP splitting. And this is a very small, well, this is a, a single molecule of a protein, and it's very small, it's only 25 nanometers. Nano means one billionth, and the, that nano simply means very, very small. And for American people, I, I changed it to a millionth of an inch. In Japan, I would say millimeters or centimeters. But it's actually one four thousandth of your hair thickness. So you see that the, this, this is very small, and you have many such motors in your brain or in your body. And that's how this ATP energy is used. And because the splitting liberates ATP, if you are to make ATP by joining these two things, you have to put in energy. And this energy comes from the oxidation or burning of the food with oxygen. And the, the point is, you don't make ATP from scratch. Instead, you recycle ATP in your body. In every place in your body, you're very wise to do this. And uh, so just joining ATP, and the all other molecular machine, machines split ATP into these two. And the, there is another molecular machine that combines these two to recycle it into ATP. And that's how we do that. And inside our body, there's this rotary engine that do, do this job. And you may be able to see that this is, I have to stress that this is not a real movie. This is just an animation. I'm going to show you, show you a real rotation. But the, uh, somehow, by rotation, uh, these things combine phosphate in white, ADP in green, into ATP. So, and this is also very small machines comparable to the two-foot motor. And there are many such rotary engines in your body. Now, uh, each of you synthesize 40 weight of ATP per day. So that, that's why you never want to eat ATP instead of eating heavy food and breathing a lot. And ATP, by the way, is not at all tasty. As an experimentalist, I tasted ATP before I came here. <laughs> and it's a little bit sour, but no taste at all. And I never want to eat 60 kilograms of ATP each day. And of course, uh, you expend the same amount of ATP, the body weight of ATP per day, and that's done by various molecular machines. And you have 10 times, billion times, billion such rotary engines from head to foot. And that's for recycling. You, you don't want to distribute ATP from your stomach to, to the long distance toward the head or foot. In every place in your body, you recycle ATP. And therefore, every part of your body must contain these rotary engines, many, many of them. And the, it's not only human. All animals, all plants, and some bacteria all rely on this rotary ATP synthesis. And so this is, I guess, the summary of my first part. Uh, we eat and breathe to rotate the tiny engines to let them make ATP. And what we actually rotate is this upper part called FO. You will soon forget, forget this name. And it rotates in this direction. But the ATP is synthesized in the lower part called F1. This is not F0, but FO for a historical, historical reason. And this 
this rotating part is, is connected to this rotary shaft of this F1 motor, which is shown in light blue. And because F4 rotates in this direction, F1, the shaft of F1 is also rotated in this direction. And then ATP is synthesized somewhere around here or, or there. But we can, we can take out this F1 portion from body. Then it rotates in the other direction, in this direction. And in this case, it splits ATP to get energy to rotate this central shaft. So in the rest of my talk, I will concentrate on this F1 portion. I'm going to show that this is a marvelous rotary motor. And this is the structure of F1 motor in isolation. There are seven parts, but the center parts in orange penetrates the outer cylinder, as you may have seen. And this is the rotary shaft called gamma. And there are three alphas in, in blue, and then there are three betas. And when this central rotor is rotated, forcibly rotated by a four in this direction, uh, ADP and phosphate is joined by the, these three betas to make ATP. This is what happens in your body. But when we take this out, uh, beta can no longer make ATP. But if it is given ATP, it can split it into ADP and phosphate, and it can obtain energy from this reaction. And then the gamma rotates in this direction. You may know that the man-made electrical motor, if it's forcibly rotated, it becomes a generator. So if you pass a current through an electrical motor, uh, it rotates, consuming the electrical energy dissipating the electrical energy. It's not dissipating, so using the electrical energy. If you forcibly rotate the electric motor in the other direction by your hands, you create electrical current, or you, you generate the electrical energy. So in that sense, this F1 and the electric motor are very similar to each other. <clears throat> but in the electrical motor made by man, there are uncountable number of atoms. In this small F1, you can count the number of atoms. So each ball represents an atom. There are only 30 atoms in width, 30 atoms in height, and 30 atoms in depth. So you can calculate how many atoms you have in this machine. And atoms, to me, are simply balls. And there are only five kinds of balls in this tiny engine. And the, so compacting the five kind of simple balls into th this shape somehow makes a marvelous motor that I'm going to show you. And of course, atoms don't have colors. So all my slides have colors, but th this is just to uh, help your understanding. Atoms don't have color, even doesn't have a white color. Anyway, so. Uh, in my talk, I hope you can remember four technical terms. ATP, it seems that most of you already know ATP. Probably most of you do not know F1, that's the rotary motor. And the gamma is the central rotor. And the beta is the driving unit when the, it, it split ATP to drive rotation of gamma. So ATP, F1, gamma, beta. And the, the rotation I showed you two slides ago was an animation, as I told you. So 20 years ago, we wanted to see whether this motor really rotates or not. So we decided to look, look into a microscope. And the, we collaborate, collaborated with Professor Yoshida. And the, this, this is myself. But you know very well that when it comes to experiment, professors are useless or even obstacles. So this is a fake cartoon, except that I did have some hair left 20 years ago. <laughs> so so it, it was actually young people who did the experiment. And to, to see rotation of this central shaft, 
this molecule is very, very small. So even if you use a very good microscope, you can never look at this molecule. So it, to see rotation, we decided to attach a long rod to this putative rotor and attach the bottom of this cylinder to a glass surface. And then we saw this rotation. This is not the rotation with gamma set. What you see here is this long rod. And the, when names in blue appear in my slide, this, that shows the name of the ma major players. Professors never appear in blue because the, those who produce results must come here. But anyway, uh, you, you have to appreciate that the, this experiment is very, very difficult because the size of the rod uh, is actually, this is 10 nanometers and the, this is about 2,000 nanometers. So 200 times as long as the size of the motor. So it will be very difficult to keep this rod level to, for, to not to let it bump the surface. So you have to be very lucky. And indeed, these two people were of type B, which I define as a type who, which is loved by Lady Luck. <laughs> and the, the Noji, the first of the two, uh, he made several mutations, or he mutations, well, he changed the F1 a little bit so that it can bind to a rod and it can bind to a surface. And he made several mutations. And the first one we tried rotated, but all others did not. And Yasuda, when he looked at the microscope, looked into the microscope, immediately found a rotating filament. And so he called me. So the rotation was very beautiful, and I was almost persuaded. But I was a scientist at least at that time. So I asked him to show me a second. And he immediately found a second. So I went out to buy cans of beer. And, but the third came only after two months of hard work from morning to night. So you see that these are very difficult experiments, at least in those days. But still, these people got it on the first day. So these two people, in my knowledge, are the most sloppy people I have ever seen. That's the definition of type B. And the Usually, for experiment, the, at least in Japan, the person should be of type A who is precise and consistent. And then you, you get a good result in ordinary experiments. But when it comes to a very difficult experiment, challenging experiment like uh, uh, aiming at a virgin peak, uh, the story may be different. Type A people prepare very well and climb step by step, paying attention to every possible problems. And after many, many days, he, he suddenly finds that there is no way uh, beyond. Type B person instead <laughs> simply jumps. He or she jumps. And he may or she may well fall, but he or she never gives up, and he jumps again from a different point. This is a point. You, you have to jump from a different point, and he never cares about possible failure or possible danger. So he tries to jump, fall, jump, jump, and fall until he finally reaches summit. So this is the kind of person Lady Luck loves. And uh, there are also two other types. Type O, uh, these people are good in finger skills. And type AB is very tenacious, sticking to his or her own principle. And of course, in the past two slides, I'm not talking about science. Uh, this is just uh, my 
personal statistics made on a sample of less than 100. So don't, you, you don't have to believe in me, but when I hire a postdoctoral post fellow, the first question I ask is, what is your type? Uh, now, with a ro long rod, we can observe rotation. And the, here you see this rod rotates around its, its middle. And this is important because if you hold an end of a long rod, you can make this fake rotation. I say this is fake because this, I'm just twisting my wrist. If you hold a long rod, this is not so long, but suppose this is longer than my height, then you can still twist it up to a certain point. But then after that, you yourself have to rotate this way. And so this movie, Propel Motion, is a proof that the, the central gamma really rotates in, against the surrounding cylinder for many, many turns. And if, you, if two people hold the wrong rod simultaneously, of course you cannot make a continuous rotation. So this is a proof that the, uh, the thing that rotates this rod is a single molecule, not a two molecule. Although we don't see the molecule, but we are pretty sure that this is a single molecule. And you notice that in all cases, the rod rotates in the counterclockwise rotation. And in most cases, the rod rotates uh, at one end. And the, the, these rotations you see here all takes place in water. All protein machines or molecular machines work in water because 80% of your body is water. So uh, these rods rotate in water and suffering from the viscous friction. Suppose you are uh, this F1 motor. Then this rod you see here is 1,000 meters or half a mile or so. This is about 500 meters. This is about two, 200 meters. And you immediately see that this, you can never do this at this speed. You, can, you, you, can, you cannot even rotate a 10 meter rod at this speed. So this is a very powerful motor. And also you notice that the, the longer one rotates slower and shorter one rotates faster. Because longer one suffers from, experiences uh, higher viscous friction from the water. And you may think that it's natural that the long govern rotates slower. But when you think that way, there, there's a tacit assumption that the motor power should be more or less constant. And that is indeed the case for this motor. And the, irrespective of the rotary speed, this motor produces the same force. If you buy a car, a, an expensive car, have this constant force char characteristics. So this is a, a very uh, good engine. And also, if you calculate the energy conversion efficiency from ATP to this mechanical rotation, it's almost 100%. The only thing that is not satisfied, that may not satisfy you, is that the, this rotation, even this one, is not as fast as the you would expect for your engine. That's because the, long was, the, the rod was too long, two, two, 200 times as long as the motor itself. But this motor, because it's strong, doesn't worry if the, instead of rod, we can, we can attach a bead. If the bead size only four times as big as the motor, you cannot do this, but the, then it rotates at this speed. And this movie has been slowed down by a factor of one, 1600. So you see that the, the full speed of this motor is very fast. And the, without going to these uh, equations, I jump to the conclusion that the rotary speed, full speed of this motor is 12, 120,000 revolutions per minute. And the, this one, 
although it happens to have the same name with a little bit difference in, 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 what? in the symbol, runs only at 20,000 revolutions per minute. So this is much higher. This number is the highest speed you can achieve with the most expensive electrical motor in the world. So our F1 is as good as the most ex expensive motor that runs only in vacuum. Our F1 runs in water. And so when you return to your car, you check this, uh, this thing. Uh, there's R per minute. This, this, this means revolutions per minute. So most of your cars has an upper limit of something like 6,000 revolutions per minute, and that is 20 times slower than the F1 in your, in your body. Now, the, the rotations I have shown you so far were all continuous, and that's because we put in a lot of fuel, ATP, in the solution. If we decrease the fuel concentration we would expect that because there are three driving units, the rotation may take place in steps of 120 degrees. And that is indeed the case that you see in this movie. It's now in seven o'clock position, and three o'clock position, and 11 o'clock position. And here you see a funny effect. So it make a one mistake, you make a back step, and then resume rotation. And you notice that the, well, it's, 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 been, it's waiting for, for the fuel to come. It fluctuates a, rock, uh, fluctuates a lot. So this graph summar summarizes the movie you have just seen. And you can buy a stepping motor uh, from an electrical shop. And a man-made machine makes a regular step, step uh, dot, 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 dot. But this one, the molecular motor, works entirely in a different fashion. There's rapid three succession of three steps, long pause, two rapid steps, and a lot of fluctuation and one step. So it seems that the, well, this is the prominent feature of all molecular machines, and the Molecular machines work by throw, throwing a dice. Every instant you throw a dice, and you, you say that if the number is three, you make a forward step, and otherwise you stay. Then you get this erratic movement. And in a, in a really bad combination, if, for example, the one, if you have a succession of 10 ones, then you go back, and that's the way the molecular machines work, and why is that? Why is molecular machines so erratic? The reason is that the molecular machines are surrounded by water molecules, and if you are a protein molecule or a molecular machine, water molecules surrounding you are gum bullets in size and weight, and their average speed is 1,000 kilometers per hour. That's the speed of a jumbo jet or of a real gun bullet from a gun, or oh, at least from a Japanese policeman have a cheap gun. So that this is the speed of the, the initial speed of the gun from a policeman. So you are continuously hit by the re, sort of real gun very, very often, and that's why uh, it fluctuates. If, of course, you are hit, hit by many water molecules, but if you are hit from this side, a little bit more molecules than this side, then you fluctuate in this direction. Next time, many more molecules come from, many more water shoot you from this side, then you go this way. And to appreciate that, uh, you can see this movie. These are not live molecules. These are just plastic bees, dead plastic bees in water, and they uh, show this uh, erotic motions. Mr. Brown found this motion, and therefore this is called Brown motion. The thing I want you, I want you to notice is that the, as the size of the bees gets smaller, 
the, the motion becomes faster and faster. But a better way of appreciating this is to uh, estimate or from, from this movie the time it takes to move over its own size. This is the way you would feel the speed uh, when you travel. So it, it, it's this nine seconds here, 0.3 seconds here. When the size of the bead becomes one half, uh, the time it feels uh, is reduced by a factor of 10. And the protein machines is 20 times less than these beads. So you can see that the protein machines must, if they are free in solution in the water, must be fluctuating a lot and lot and lot, lot. And this is the key to understand the behavior of molecular machines. They always fluctuate and they throw dice. They, they are forced to throw dice because of the bombardment by water molecules. Now I'm going to show you that the, uh, so far we've been just watching the uh, movement, but we can also manipulate a molecular machine, uh, for example, with a magnet. Uh, instead of a long, long rod, we attach a plastic bead containing iron. Then we can ro rotate the machine uh, with magnets. And the, this movie shows that initially it rotating on its own, but applying magnet, we can let it rotate in a regular fashion in the opposite way. And have we, have we broken this machine? No, it can resume the uh, proper rotation. And you can do this even with a small toy magnet. If you come to my lab, I can let you do this with your fingers. If you wrote a small magnet with your fingers, uh, this small engine rotates according to your finger motion. Now, when it was rotating in this direction, clockwise, then it must have been uh, making ATP. And well, there was ATP and phosphate in the medium. So uh, once you're able to should be able to prove that this one indeed makes ATP. So for that, we added a firefly protein that converts ATP into light. And the, even without rotation, some light came. But when we rotate it, uh, more light came. Then this is a proof that the ATP was indeed synthesized. So F1 alone. Without the help of FO, if you rotate them, you get ATP. And this, I think, is the first ever in the history of human that, where you succeeded in chemical synthesis by applying brute force. And, but this person was unfortunately of type A. <laughs> and therefore, it took seven years for him to show this result. But, but anyway, so this rotary engine, F1, is a reversible machine, uh, as in the case of electrical motor. So F1 alone, you don't need the other part, F4, suffices for ATP <coughs> synthesis. Now, uh, you, you may wonder how rotation makes ATP. I don't have the time to give you a full explanation, so I, I give you just some hint. If you look at the structure uh, of the, this motor, the, the driving summit beta, when, when it binds ATP or ADP, the upper portion of the beta is bent toward gamma, as though it is pushing the gamma. And when it is empty, after ADP has left, it uh, pulls back, and as though pulling this gamma in this direction. So if you give ATP to this, to this machine, and if the three beta subunit uh, do this in a coordinate fashion, uh, because the central gamma is slightly curved, uh, you, you, can, you can see that the central gamma may well rotate. And this is, again, just an animation 
but probably something like this happens in this motor and how the ATP splitting drives this rotation of the central shaft. And if you rotate this shaft by your fingers in the other direction, what happens is that the, the speed of something changes the shape from here to here to here. So when the beta is forced to bend by the motion of this gamma, then it, is, it picks up ATP from the medium, and then it picks up phosphate from the medium, and it becomes ATP. And then when it, it is forced to uh, bend back, the ATP is released in the solution. This is basically what happens, I hope, I think, in, in the F1. So before I finish, I want to show you uh, what we are now doing. The, uh, I said that this, this is uh, just an animation and we want to confirm by experiment that this may well be true. And the, I cannot explain everything to you, but what we do here is that with magnets, we slowly rotate the central shaft and we see the rotation in this panel. And at the same time, we put in solution ADP that glows. Uh, and when ADP is bound to F1, you see white things here that, that shows binding of ADP. And if you half close your eyes, you might agree that the white spot you see here are divided into, in this way. And that I show uh, with green hemicircles, as, as, as you see here. You have to watch it very carefully, and you have to trust me. That's not the way of science. You have to doubt me, but anyway. So <laughs> in this way, uh, we can uh, see the orientation of bound ADP. And because there are three beta that binds ADP, uh, when ADP binds in this beta, it must be in this direction. Then uh, if it's here, it's in this direction. If it's here, in this direction. So we can discriminate which of the three beta has bound ADP. And at the same time, we can watch this uh, motion of the bead. It fluctuates a lot because it's bombarded by water. But you may also notice that the average speed of rotation is fast in some cases and slow in other cases. The magnet is rotated at a uniform speed. So slow motion implies that the motor, the UFA motor, resists the motion of the magnet. If it's fast, it yields to the magnets. This way, we can measure the force uh, the FO motor produces. And I don't have time to explain you the results, but we are trying to understand, fully understand, how this motor works. So at the end of my talk, uh, I just show you uh, fun movies. This is another molecular machine called Top Isomerase. Don't worry about the name. What it does is that the, well, the, you know that DNA is a long string. This is an exceptionally long molecule. And we can let two DNA molecules entwine each other by manipulating these bees attached to the end of the DNA. So you make one turn, and the two DNA molecules are crossed, and you simply wait. And alas, the, the one DNA past the other without breaking the other things. So this happens in your body uh, very, very often. In this movie, movie, we have wound one DNA 30 times around the other. And then we, we simply wait it. Uh, then 30 turns were resolved in a second or two. So you may wonder how this can take place. So, but don't think while you are driving. After you have come back home, you may start to think about how this may be possible in your body. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
We're going to be opening, the, uh, we're going to be opening for questions in just a minute, but before that I have a, a presentation for Dr. Kanoshta, um, and I'm going to show it to all of you. If I can lift it. That's beautiful. Um, hopefully you can see this. Um, here, laser engraved in a crystal is the F1, FO, ATPase that he's been telling you all about. So this will cause him to go over a weight with his baggage on his way back to Japan. So, this is cool. Thank you very, very much. Thank you indeed. All right. Would anyone like to ask a question? The question was, was, does the phosphate in, the, in this equation come from the food? What is the phosphate? Phosphate, yes, it does come from the food. But I told you that we recycle. So we don't have to eat ADP and phosphate. ATP is split, and we recombine them. But Mother Nature is so wise that she doesn't ask us to take up ADP and phosphate. It's already there. So the question is, why don't we reduce things to the lowest energy components to CO2 and, and water? Why do, we, why do we use the chemical pathway that we do use? The, <laughs> it works. If, if you re literally burn the food, you simply get CO2 and, and water. Then the only thing you can do is to use the heat to do work. And this is the least efficient way of using energy. But by using this rotary engine, you get 100% efficiency. And that's because, well, I, 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 can, I can give you a better, more scientific explanation after. But the, the, to, to explain this in a, in a minute, minute is, is too difficult. Yeah, sorry. Right here. The, the, the question was that the long rod was turning at, uh, around the end, and, and the other one was turning around the middle. Yeah. And it's not that I, I'm, they are supposed to rotate at the end or middle. The, it just happens that the rod, uh, rod attaches to any point. Yeah, yeah. That's a protein rod called actin. So actin is a small molecule that makes a filament. Thank you. Ah, sorry, I forgot to repeat the question. What makes a rod? Right here. What type of imaging device did you use to create the movies you saw? The, the, what kind of device did we use to create the movies? Although Steve said at the beginning, that most people in this field use a sophisticated optical element, instruments. In our hands, we just use a simple microscope, and the, the rod, uh, we can let it glow by attaching fluorescent dyes. So a simple microscope you can find in a high school or even a junior high school would do this job.
Could you repeat that for me? So, so if I can slightly reinterpret question, uh, as I understand it, the question is, why does it rotate in the particular direction that it does rotate as opposed to the other direction? And is this, is this related in some way to intrinsic properties of proteins and their handedness, or, or perhaps something in particle physics? Um, so the image, uh, and you know, in a mirror world, would it go the other way around? <laughs> it, this was a question you asked. What, what, <laughs> why, what, why it rotates in a particular direction? Yes. The only answer is that the mother nature made it this way. <laughs> the, you know that the amino acids has two, two things, that the right-handed amino acids that we you know, made of and the left-handed ones. If you go to a different star, they may use a left-handed amino acids, then it may rotate in the other direction. Spin in an electron, for example. Half-life. Uh, what's the half-life of ATP when it recycles? It's a very good question. I've never counted. Well, no, I know the answer. Uh, the, it's something like one millisecond, one thousandth of a second. A little bit more than that. Okay, the question is that we have shown that with electrical magnets, we can rotate the molecules. And the question is, if we apply magnet to our body, do we rotate the molecules? The answer is no. Because we, we've been able to rotate the molecules because we attach the magnetic piece that contain iron. So, well, if you drink a lot of magnetic particles, <laughs> then you might be able to rotate some of your rotary engines. Okay, the, does electric magnetic field affect the rotation? Uh, I'm not a... So my answer is definitely no. But there are some envir environmentalists who may say that there might be a subtle effect that I can never uh, hmm? disprove as a scientist. Question there? What causes FO to rotate to drive F1? Okay. What causes FO to drive rotation? That, that's a very good question. And I wanted to talk about this if the audience was all physicists. <laughs> and it's the proton. The hydrogen ion, do you understand proton? It's, the, it's just the core of the hydrogen atom. And there are lots of protons in our body. And if we, when protons flow through the FO, it somehow rotates this. It's like a water wheel. And this mechanism is not yet fully understood. There are so many models, but they are just models. The athletes, the question is athletes uh, spend more energies, and does it mean that the motor runs faster? Well, I prepared one slide that shows something, another equation. This is not the speed, but the, suppose you carry 100 kilo including your weight and, and backpack, and you bring it up to 3,000 meters high. That, that is a lot of work I can never do. But if you calculate the work you need 
to do this much job, it's only 3,000 kilo, kilojoule, which is about one third of this number. And after this, you of course eat a lot more, no, no, just a little bit more <laughs> to compensate. And so if the motor is to run faster, only 30% at most, it's the, the physical exercise that, that you do is actually nothing compared to the energy consumption while you are sleeping. Even if you sleep, you expend this much of energy. So if, uh, with that, I'd like to thank our speaker, Professor Kinosha. Thank you, everybody. Does anyone have any questions right now? I'm sorry, what? I have one question. Oh, you have a question in the balcony. Yes. All right. I will indulge. If the audience will indulge, we will accept a question from the balcony. <laughs> Okay, the question is, does this take place inside the cell or outside the place? Certainly inside the cell. So every recycling takes place inside the cell. And more particularly, if you know the word mitochondria, it takes place in mitochondria. I have to apologize because of the spotlights we're in. You are virtually invisible to us up there. All right, with that, uh, let us thank Professor Kudak for one more time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent job.